I can't hear me, so that's the problem. All right. I am uh, going to continue the series, Tackling Evil's Triple Threat. I've been thinking about this since Mike did his thing last week about how best to do this and so um, how to best look at the text. And the way I do it best is to think about people in my life that um, I think need to understand that. Like people that I work with who are struggling with habits that they can't break or don't seem to be broken and they claim the promises of the gospel and believe in the Lord and yet still struggle. Or like the men and women who I get the chance to meet who struggle with being victims of some sort of uh, trauma, or some sort of attack or an assault. And they're trying to make sense of what it was that drove the attack. This passage is puzzling because Paul makes a promise and he and will look at the promise he makes, but more importantly, um, we'll look at the focus that that promise forces us to take. Because if we take the right focus, if we take the right focus, we can live the way Paul is challenging us to live. I want to read something to you from um, Chuck Swindoll in a book called Seasons. Um, Seasons of Life. Let me see if I got it marked out. I won't be reading something for me. So I'm not going to stand up here and try to find it. Ah. All right, I'll read something else. Thank you. Oh, no, here we go. Here we go. I had it and went right past it. This book is a devotional. I don't know how many of you read Chuck Swindoll. I don't like listening to Chuck. Don't, don't feel no hate, Chuck. But I love reading it because his, he, his, his speaking voice to me is a little bit, well, I won't say what it is, but I just, I ain't feeling him. I ain't feeling him. But when I read his stuff, I feel him. And I really like the way he writes. I like, I love the way he writes. And he, he wrote this chapter in this book in, the, in um Seasons of Reverence, and the title of this little devotional chapter is called Secret Rooms, Silent Cries. And he says this, tucked away in the corner of the scripture is a verse that brims with emotion. Read thoughtfully, these ancient words from Job, from Job's pen, or read thoughtfully the ancient words from Job's pen. And Job writes, from the city men groan. And the souls of the wounded cry out. Job 24, 12. He says, Behind and beneath the loud splash of human activity and invisible aches, Job calls them groans. In the Hebrew, the word suggests that this groan comes from one who has been wounded. Perhaps this is why Job adds the next line to the poetic form. The souls of the wounded cry. In that line, wounded comes from the term that means pierced, as if stabbed. Not a physical stabbing, for it is, for it is the soul that's crying out. What does this mean? There are those who suffer from blows of soul stabbing, wounds which, cannot, which can be far more painful and devastating than body stabbing. Job has reference to deep lacerations of the heart. Inside, internal injuries no surgeon in the world could detect. The city is full of such hurts. It's a desolate, disturbing scene, but painfully true. Wounded, broken, bruised, many people cry, 
many persons' cries with groans from the innermost being. Perhaps, he says, this describes you. You may be groaning because you've been misunderstood or treated unfairly. The injury is deep because the blow landed from someone you trust and respect, someone you are vulnerable to, or someone you love. He said, but you will endure, you will keep quiet, and you will bleed. And I was thinking about that, thinking this passage in this series, we're talking about sinful, the sinful nature's desires. And we read this tricky passage, which says this, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. So you do not do what you want to. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, I thought that that passage to say if you're led by the spirit, you shouldn't mess up. Anybody see that same version in there? If God's inside you and he's running things, you shouldn't mess up. You should be able to do it perfect. But that's not what it says. So let's look at this and break it down. There's a parallel passage in Romans. I put it in your um, insert. There's a parallel passage in Romans, and most of the commentators put these together. In Romans 8, it says this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. If your sinful nature controls your mind, there is death. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God, it never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are under the control of the sinful nature will never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Some of y'all are saying, huh? Did you see me last night? You wouldn't be saying that, Paul, if you saw me last night. Of course, I was on the ball court, so I, you know, I, I was... I was okay, but the, the night before that, I wasn't good, right? You are controlled by the Spirit, and if you have the Spirit of God living in you, and remember those of, though, that those who do not live have the Spirit of Christ living in them are not Christians. So we have the living Spirit in us. The emphasis is a little bit different, but the teaching is the same. There seems to be, according to the text, a set of desires that our sinful nature is wired for. And there seems to be, to the contrary, desires that the spirit aspires to. Now, some of us confuse the following verses that follow after that with what those are. There's a list A and a list B. One's called the signs of a lustful nature or the signs of the flesh. And the other one's called the fruit of the spirit. Okay? But that's not the deal. Those are the results of desires. So we live in a place where our desires are in conflict. But if you're sitting in this room and I'm looking at you, and, you, and I can see you, and you can see me. Of course, you can see me, but you don't know. I can see all y'all looking like this. <laughs> I can see you. And if you're in eye distance of me, then, the, then God's Spirit's in you, whether you believe it or not. And what Paul writes is those two desires are in conflict, but he doesn't write them that they're in conflict as if there's going to be a stalemate. See, what happens is, the spirit that lives in you is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 
and it will overcome. It will overcome the sinful nature. Now, here's what we need to understand. That process, because I know some of y'all are going to know when. Okay, so when is this going to stop? For some of y'all, for most of us, it won't stop till we get home. There is a casket we have to go through to get to the other end. But I'm telling you that it will change. The other thing that that list A and list B creates that I want to talk about on the front end is it creates an external focus. It creates us looking at our navels. I'm not going to show you mine because it sticks out, so I'm going to show it to you. But we spent, spent a bunch of time looking at our navels because of the list. So how am I doing? Is this list A or this list B? Okay? And that isn't Paul's intention either. Now, knowing the law is supposed to do something. You know what that is? The law is supposed to do something. When you're a believer, the law, the law is supposed to identify a problem. The law is to set the standard high enough that all of us go, I don't know if I can clear that one, or run at the bar and bang our heads. And then we say, you know what, God, I can't get that one. Can you get it for me? The law's job, Paul calls the law a tutor. The tutor was a person that got a kid from the house to school. Did you know that? In the, in the in Hebrew culture, a tutor was, I would hire Brian to get my daughter from the house to the school, and he would use a little stick sometimes to get her along. Come on, girl, let's go. And get her. The law is the tutor. The law isn't what we're aspiring to do. The law is the, the tutor. It gets us from the place we're living to the creator who loves us and who wants to say, you're my kid. Did you know you're my kid? And, but, but you don't know, Lord. I, <laughs> no, you're my kid. I, do you know what I know about you? Well, I hope not. <laughs> no, I know, right? So the law is a tutor. So I want you to understand that before we get into this because I'm going to show you some things and I want to focus there. So, the, so when you feel conviction, not, I'm not talking about guilt, but when the Holy Spirit says, hey, uh, Terry, what was that about, dude? That attitude you just went, that thing that just flashed across your eye that t- Tammy didn't see, what was that? <laughs> and he might say, man, Lord, leave me alone right now, man. I'm in the middle of this. But when he gets that flash... That's not God saying, I'm going I'm to smash you. It's God saying, hey, man, you know the standard? Look where you at. And Terry goes, I thought I was like this. Bam. And then you look up and there's a hand reaching down. Okay? So that's the job of the law. Now, I want to make another distinction I found out. As I'm studying, I found out this, that in the days when Paul was writing, we had a different, different situation when we looked at government policies. See, Paul's language made sense to the Hebrews and the Jews there and the Roman Christians there because the governmental policies and procedures, let me just ask you this question. Now, you got to promise me you answer it honestly, okay? I got your head. Let me see this. Do this for me one time. I don't see everybody. I will stand here till I see everybody. <laughs> Here's what I want to ask you. How many of you went two miles over the speed limit coming to church this morning? Raise your hand up. Okay. Raise your hand up high like that so everybody, so you look around, everybody can see we won the law. Okay. Now, here's my question for you. Did that two mile infraction of the law, it was breaking the law, y'all. I forgot I got to get my friend, the officer, because he saw all y'all. It was breaking the law. Here's my question. Have anything to do with your faith? I can't hear you. Talk to me. It have anything to do with your faith? In Paul's day, the belief was adherence to the law brought favor from God. So when he said we're not under the law, that was a radical thing to say. Because what he was saying was complying with the law and doing good stuff according to government procedures is not going to get you in with God. Did you hear me? 
And when they heard that, they was tripping. Like, what? <laughs> Wait a minute, man. Dude, the, the Pharisee dude told me, if I do all this stuff, I'm going to heaven. Paul said, mm, nah. <laughs> Don't think so. And they flipped out. They flipped straight out. Okay? See, we, we see it, and he says the law. We don't even know what he's talking about because, see, we all operate by two miles over the speed limit. It don't matter. They don't have nothing to do with me and Jesus. Jesus, you saw me. You know, it's cool. I had to, you know, Jay's preaching. Got to get to church, man. You know, it had nothing to do with, it had nothing to do with our faith, right, and our connection to God. But in those days, when you, every time you adhere to a law, every time you complied with the government procedures, even if they were crooked, you assume that brought favor, okay? So you need to understand that, okay? So when Paul's writing, he's saying some radical stuff, revolutionary stuff. That's why they wanted to kill him, because he was saying some radical stuff. When he said, you are no longer under the law as it relates to God, they were like, dude, you better be quiet, man. That'll get you killed around here, dude. He said, I don't care, man. I'm crazy for Jesus. I'm going to bring the gospel. I'm going to bring the good news that's good news. Because what he knew was there was a bunch of people who was cheating the law and wasn't living under it anyway. Couldn't live under it. And he also knew that the law was corrupt in a lot of places. As a matter of fact, what was in the law, what was custom in Roman, in, in Roman times, was not okay in God's law. And he knew that. And so he said, if you adhere to the social law, if you adhere to the customs of our time, you're violating God's law anyway. And you cannot tell me you're going to be close to God. I don't care if the taxpayer, the guy you pay taxes to said, that's good, man, what you did just right there. That was good. God's saying, mm, because there's only one way to heaven, and that's through See, there was one guy who lived the code. I call it the code, the law. There was one guy who lived the code. There was one guy who joined Weight Watchers and dropped the weight. Right? Y'all just see, y'all heard me now. I see the whole bunch of faces like, oh, we know. Because see, we are, code is everywhere. You know, my daughter goes to school and everybody's wearing Abercrombie and Fitch or whatever that is. That's a code, right? If you don't wear the code, if you don't adhere to the code, people are like, Pfft. You must be a freak, man. You don't shop at Abercrombie? Hey, I can't even say it, man. <laughs> right? It's a cold. It's a cold. That's why TV works. TV says, you're breaking the cold, but we got the stuff for you. You're breaking the cold. You heavy? You feel a little puffed up? We got this Nutrisystem food for you. You just eat it and... <laughs> right? And so the cold goes. That's... That's what we, so that's the law. Law is everywhere, everywhere. Anything that says do this and don't do this, that's cold. Anything. My wife used to work at Citibank. They audited her phone calls. She would get accounted for all the quotas. She had to make 60 bazillion phone calls in two minutes. <laughs> right? And then supervisor like, what? Huh? What? What? You under the code. We all live by code, right? So that's the thing. So he says, you can't make it living under the code. Now, some of you know that because I see you in here when you first, before I start talking, you was doing like this. See, because the cold makes you tired. I call it the cold dehydrates you. It takes all the juice out of you. And some of you, some of you, the cold was broke from outside. And some of you, you know your cold's broke inside. Most of us have both struggles. Okay, so let's look at that. I and mean, we clear it in. Okay. All right. So what does the sinful nature desire? What does it desire? Well, I'm going to tell you. Because that, that word desire, that's just one word. I looked it up 15 different ways, backwards, spelled it backwards, put it on a turntable and turned it backwards to see, to see what desire was. And here's what I found out. Sinful desire desires that we live like slaves. Now, I can say slaves because it means something to me, right? It means something to me. The sinful nature desires that we live like slaves, that we live under the burden 
under the burden of law, under the burden of the code, under the burden of the weight, under the burden of whatever it is you got, anger, envy, jealousy. You know, we always raise up the big ones, fornication, adultery, blah, blah, blah. I'm telling you, there's some termites in there that'll kill you. Jealousy will kill you. Envy will kill you. Bitterness will kill you. Bitterness will take you to the hospital quicker than some of the other ones will, okay? But he wants us to live under that. See, like this drama said, I can swim, Haley said. This feels kind of good, and then the turn got her. And as soon as you get in it, it feels good, and then as soon as you try to get out, see, a fish don't know it's hooked till, you, till it tries to swim away. I was out of Rapid City doing my fly rod, getting zeros. <laughs> So I went and got my top secret weapon, some marshmallows, put it on the hook, <laughs> dropped it out there, and let the line set. And the fish come, nice size trout, man, like about, no, I mean about like this big, <laughs> you know. Came by, bit the thing. I'm thinking they swimming around. And I can see the line jiggling, right? And the trout ain't doing nothing until I go whoop, and all of a sudden it goes the exact opposite way. But guess what? I got you now, you swap. You sucker, I got ya. <laughs> I pulled that fish in, he had that marshmallow all the way down up in here, right? So I don't know I'm a slave until I decide to stop. I, I, I can't keep doing this, and I can't keep thinking like this. And then the sinful nature says, nah, man, you're a slave to this, watch this. And you can't stop. And you can roll up your sleeves and you know, work out with whoever you want to work out with, you won't be able to stop it. That's what slavery is about. Slavery is the system that we're wired for that on our own power we can't overcome. The second thing that the sinful nature desires is that we live afraid of God, right? Now, look, when we were in our sin, the Bible says there was immunity between me and and Jesus. There was hostility between me and Jesus, between me and God. But when I come to Christ, Christ tears down the wall of hostility. There no longer exists heat between. You know, God ain't looking at me like, boy, you don't straighten up. Like my dad used to do when I messed up. You know, my grandma, 4'11", when she had muscles like this, she said, boy, and I'm like, oh, no, nah. until one day I came home and looked over her head, and then she told me the story about knocking my six-foot-four grandfather out. I said, I still ain't going to mess with her then. <laughs> okay? Want us to be afraid. Now, here's what I want you to know. It makes us not only afraid of God, but it also makes us unwilling to live under authority. See, it ripples. Sinful nature says God's crazy. He got a furled eyebrow or he got his back turned to you. And do you know that I did an unofficial survey when I was working in treatment for 10 years? We had to do a program where we talked with recovering folks about, about spirituality. And I did something just on the secret just to see. I, had, I always had my folks describe, describe God. And they would describe him as angry, uncaring, back turned, rejecting, judgmental, blah, 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 blah. And I set him up. And we talk a little bit, blah, blah, blah. And then I say, describe the word father. Uncaring, angry, blah, 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 blah. So what happens is that ripples. And what we find is that whoever's the authority figure in your house, be it mom or dad, if you think God's mad at you, then you probably think she or he's mad at you. And when you're working for somebody, you treat authority like they're mad at you. Now, you only got two options then. I'm either going to, you know, give authority to Bird. Look, look at you, man. I ain't got nothing to do with you. You can't tell me what to do. Or I'm going to smile. Yes, sir. No, sir. And smile. That codependent smile, Claudia Vaisley. You got to do that for me. Smile real big. Till it hurts to your face. Smile, let me see it. Now freeze and hold that for about 10 years. All right? Okay? We either got to do one of those two things if God's angry at us. Okay? I'm either going to try to comply or I'm going to assume he's not, he's going to turn his back on us. But law wants us to be afraid of God. 
Law also wants us to, desires that we focus on ours and others' performances, right? So I'm going to spend a bunch of time because I'm going to do two things. I'm going to look at my performance. I'm going to gaze at my performance and glance at God because I'm scared of him. The problem is when I do that, I always find out I'm not measuring up. Or I think I'm all that. I'm looking down at y'all through the top of my nose. <laughs> y'all suck, man. You know, if you live your life like me, you would be on. But you got, you know, I understand why you're having problems in your life because you don't live like I do. And see, God ain't happy with that kind of attitude. But you only got two choices. I'm either going to inspect my life and feel contempt for myself, or I'm going to inspect my life and feel pride for myself and contempt for you. That makes sense. No options. There is, this is black and white. Now, I normally don't tell people about black and white. This is black and white, though. <laughs> I'm either going to feel contempt for myself or contempt for you. Okay? And I'm going to use contempt by looking at how you adhere to the code. You know? So I look at my friend Dave, or I, you know, look at some of my friends here, Rob, and say, oh, man, dude, you need to lose some weight, man. You know, obviously, you ain't working out, dude. Huh? What's up with that? And Rob's 6'4", he might smash me, but I don't care, because I'm better than him, because I'm losing weight. You know, I'm going to either do that, or I'm looking and say, dang, I'm getting fat. I better get some big pants so they can't see. <laughs> right? Right? Okay. So, focus. The, sim the sinful nature also desires that we fall under the spell. See, Paul Wright wrote in the, in the, I think, the third chapter. He said to the Galatians, who bewitched you? Who put you under a spell? Who made you forget what I taught you? Who was it? You guys walking around like this. Yes, master. Who did it? That's deception. See, somebody will come and say, oh, you know Jesus, Jesus for free, da 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 And then somebody reach in his pocket and say, hey, man, you know that Jesus for free stuff is good, man. But I got the thing in my pocket. But you want to get rich? Love Jesus and claim your promise. Claim richness. You want to get healed? Love Jesus and go bang your head on the wall six times and then spin around and you'll get your healing. And they add to it, Jesus plus something. You know, because none of us want to live in the face of tension. See, I have asthma. Do you want to know? No, you don't want to know how many times I prayed for asthma to go away. Put my hand on the TV. I'm showing y'all. Y'all should be laughing because this is stupid. I put my hands on the TV. Come on, come on, dude. Give me some of that, man. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. You know, I'm chasing it. When I first became a Christian, because I had a friend told me that Christians should be the most wealthiest people, and should, if you're sick, there's sin in your life. So for a while, I just said, forget Jesus, man. Sin in my life, because you ain't healing me of this. So there must be something deeply wrong. God, I know some stuff. You mean to tell me that's leading to my asthma? And I had a friend who seemed to have his stuff. He was all shiny, and so it made sense. When I compared myself to him, hey, man, he must be right. And then Mike was preaching a sermon at this other church called The Greatest Sermon Ever Taught, and he taught. And I went, oh, I can come out from underneath that, man. That's crazy. But it's deception. See, deception gets me to believe things to be true that aren't, and not to believe things that are true, right? I believe things to be true that aren't, and I don't believe things to be true that are. That's deception. And the, the sinful nature wants us to be a slave, be afraid of God, focus on ourselves and focus on others' performances, and live trapped under deception. But most of all, most of all, y'all, let's see if I can get this to work. The sinful nature desires that we not act like children of God. Most of all. So I was looking for a whole bunch of complicated stuff. And what I found out was 
Our sinful nature gets all messed up if we start acting like we're children of God. But if we don't, if we act like we're outcasts, if we act like we don't belong, we're not connected to God, all kinds of craziness can set in. Because, see, if I'm not connected to God, then, then life's a mess for me. Because then guess who's the king of the kingdom? If there's not a God in my life, a God who loves me for free and who accepts me where I'm at, who knows what, he knows what I know and knows everything about me, if there's not a God like that in my life, I'm in trouble. Because then it leaves me to take over. And I'm going to tell you a secret, you don't really want me running my life. You don't want me running your life. You know what? I don't want you running my life either. Because it'll be a mess. So sinful nature desires that. So I, I said this. Sinful des desires of the sinful nature. What are they? When you think about this thing, those four things, but what happens is we don't feel it like be a slave. The words don't come. Be a slave. Be afraid of God. Focus on people's performance. All we feel is this overwhelming drive. And the drive's focus is to attempt to live my life on my terms and under my control. Why? Because I'm scared. Started in the garden, right? And it's just a perception of being alone. See, the sinful desire, if I'm not a child of God, the sinful desire desires me to not be a child of God because I'm severed from God and I'm alone. And if I'm alone, now he got me. So Satan said to Adam, they said, hey, man, we, have you tried the tree over there, dude? And Adam and Eve said, no, nah, hey, man, we, we ain't supposed to mess with that tree, man. I mean, God told us to take us out. Satan said, are you sure? I mean, you God's a loving God. He would never say anything like that. That don't even sound like Jesus. I mean, I talked to the brother yesterday. That don't sound like him. Except for real. He said, yeah, I'm telling you, he would never say anything like that. And now I do something that severs my relationship. Now I got to fig leave it. Now I got to cover up and take care of myself. God comes back to the garden and Adam starts babbling about what's wrong because he had the perception now, I need to be afraid of God. He had the perception now, my performance sucks. I better cover up. He had the perception. God said, what's up? This is the first time he went, dude, you know that lady you gave me, man? The rib? You need to put the rib back, man, because you took, you took the wrong rib, man, because the rib you took, she's a mess, man. You need to take the rib back, man. And get this one right here, it'll work, man. It'll come out perfect. She'll be a perfect, whoop, you know. <laughs> That's what happened. You know, because I'm, I'm blaming. As soon as, you know, that's what happens. When I'm alone, I hurl responsibility and I run from character. And when I, when I fall, I can't look at me, not publicly. So then I do what Adam did. You know, and Eve said, you know, the devil made me do it. You know, and, and well, you know, it was the serpent, man. I, 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 have you ever seen a serpent have legs? It had legs and it was talking to me, man. I, you would listen to it too. <laughs> right? So, but as soon as that happened, now I got to live my life under my control. You know, because now I turn my back on God. See, the thing is, what's the truth? God never turns his back on us. So guess who's the coof boof balls who does it? Don't all y'all answer at once. It's us. We do like this. And they're talking about, where you at? <laughs> like, like my little daughter, we used to play this game. Peekaboo, you ever play peek with your kids, right? And my daughter would do this. I can't see you. You ain't here. Just because she couldn't see me, I was gone. I'm like, I'm right here. No, you ain't. I can't see you. That's how we do. God, I can't see you. So you must have left me. Nah, I wouldn't like that. So, so what happens then is the sinful nature goes in and it creates these desires that are opposed to God. Now, the opposition is simply this. The sinful desires are opposed to us having a relationship with God that's an Abba, Father relationship, a daddy 
relationship with the Father. And when we do that, then it sets up a bunch of stuff. Sets up gratification of my own sensual desires. See, because if I don't have God giving me some direction, giving me some balance, giving me direction, being the motivator, then I got to do it myself. And I get caught up in the now, and I just want to, I want to have my way and be smiling because I don't like tension. I don't like struggles. I don't like hassles. You know, I'm at work, and my counselors, they don't want to do what I'm asking them to do. And so I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the bar and get me something to drink. Then I don't have no counselors no more. It goes away. Or, you know what, man, I'm tired of working at this factory. Come home, my wife saying, how you doing? I grabbed the remote, and I'm just a remote addict. And I'm gone. Did you know that you're more relaxed in front of the TV than you are when you're sleeping in your bed? Did you know that? Clicking channels. You know, I'm gone. Those things then turn into substitutes. I start looking to the TV, to magazines, to reading, to whatever I get involved in as a substitute for what I should be getting vertically. So I start looking too. It isn't so much that those things actually, we say, okay, I don't want God, I'm going to choose this. That ain't how it works. It's God's mad at me or I'm mad at God, so I'm going to turn my back. And when I turn my back, I dig a well that won't hold water. And after a while, it, it's, it becomes work. See, the scripture says to men, you know, the curse for you will be you will turn to work. And the work will yield thistles and thorns, but you're going to try and convert it. And so men spend a bunch of time trying to convert work into gold when God's already said you're going to get thorns and thistles. And when you eat those, they make you sick, right? No, nah, man, I'm going to turn this into a gold mine, man. And God promised that's how men's wired. We're wired to work, but work is never going to give us the life because we're supposed to get it here, right? Women, on the other hand, are wired for relationship. But God said your ambition will be for the man. That, I, I won't even get into the gender stuff about that, okay, because I don't want to get killed. All right. But what I know about that is ambition ain't a good word. It's the same word as lust. It's, it means I want that position that he has or she has or whatever. I want it. It sets a direction, say, I see something out there and I'm going to get it. I want that. And it's tied into relationships. So I asked a friend of mine out in Columbus, Ohio, I said, what's if men tend to get in trouble with work and extramarital affairs, what's the women issue? She said, oh, Jay, man, it's the same thing. It's relationships. We look for the perfect relationship, whether it be a girlfriend or a husband or son or daughter, and we get tied into that. Okay? So it ends up happening then is those things that we get from those relationships this way end up substituting for what we're supposed to be getting from God. Because the sinful desire says you can't get it from God. He don't care about you. Okay? And then what ends up happening is inevitably failures in, in relationships. Sins we try to manage because we can't legislate against. I can't make them. I got this stuff in my life and I'm trying to legislate. I'm trying to move the powers that be and I can't. Okay? And it affects my relationships. If I invest in something other than God and people then that investment captures me. That makes sense. If I invest in something other than God and the people in my life, that investment captures me. It's captivating. And you can't give your love to two things. So I can't give love to my job and to my wife at the same time. I can show you a picture of me in ICU after trying. Right? Y'all think I'm, y'all's laughing, but I'm, I'm, my feelings are hurt because y'all laughed at me. Because it's for real. I can show you a picture with needles in my neck and beepers going in the tube because I, I tried to straddle the fence. I tried to live and give my life to work and then give my family just a little, you know, throw them a little bit. Is that good? Okay, go back to work. About kill me. Well, my wife would tell you they didn't know if I was coming back, right? And some of you looking at me or you ain't looking at me, this ain't a judgment. I'm just saying to you. 
and I'm just saying to you, it's not, it's not about curse or whatever. It's just the thing is, if you try to give your, your investment of love to two different things, it'll kill you. So if I give my investment to God, he's going to give me the juice I need. Okay? But that doesn't mean it's, it's tension-free. Usually what we need is tension to get to God. Right? Okay. okay, so let's just look at this, this list a little bit. So the sinful desire, the desire, okay, is the problem. Okay? Desire is where the conflict is. Now, some of you got this thing flipped around. You think these behaviors I'm going to show you is where is the issue. They're not the issue. I'm only showing them to you because the law, you need to know, okay? But it's not the issue. The issue is my desires are in conflict, okay? So some of us will struggle as a symptom of crazy desires, unrighteous comparisons, and that's where envy, jealousy, and greed come in. I'm not going to even cover them a lot. Just want you to, unrighteous comparisons. There we go. Some of us will struggle with unrighteous demands. Unrighteous demands. So, anger, dispute, strife, intimate. I can't even say that. I ain't going to try to say it. I always mess it up. And factions, okay? So those are demands that are unrighteous. They're not the kind of demands that as I live under the Spirit, I start to understand. Now, I have them. All the stuff I have. Paul didn't write. He was writing to Christians. So these are stuff that he said, this is in y'all. I see it. Don't focus on it, but it's in y'all. And if you let it do what it's supposed to do, it brings you to God. Now, if, I ain't going to ask you to raise your hand, but anybody see themselves right now? No, I ain't looking. I ain't look. You see yourselves. Don't mess around and talk about I got to fix that. Man, I'm envious, man. Jeez, he just put it up on the screen, didn't he? There it go. Why you had to do that? He wrote this for me? No. I put it on there so you could see it and go, oh. So you mean that I'm supposed to go to God with that? Yeah. Because the Holy Spirit in you wants to grab that and turn it. But we need to be aware of it so we know where to go. See, this stuff, I'm just showing it to you so you know where to go with it. There's a doctor that wants to work on you. And, and, and it, ain't, it ain't Dr. Chambers or Dr. Anderson. or It's a doctor who, who like, does real stuff, like real stuff. My daughter once said, my dad's a doctor, the kind that don't do anything. <laughs> I accept that. Because the real doctor, he does something, Right? Unrighteous relationships, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. And I just put some, some sayings there. I want him or her. I can't come to God like this. Because impurity is about that. Impurity is this whole notion of, of having stuff in me that I decide makes me unqualified to come to God with. Okay, because it's on the list. God said it's not good. So he must... He must, that means not good means don't come to me. Not. Okay. Debauchery. I want to be in a frenzy. I want to have violence. I want to have Jerry Springer. I want to have, I want to have the fight dudes. And we're, if you turn on the TV, you'll get in a frenzy. There's nothing on TV that's like cool, calm. You know, you just chill when you're front of the TV. You ever watch yourself in front of the TV? You know, screaming at the football team or... You know, swinging, you know, come on, man, knock him out, or whatever it is. TV gets you in a frenzy. If you turn the TV on in the middle of the night, you won't be able to sleep after you turn it off. You be all worked up. Because <laughs> it's all, you know, all these stuff that have to do with losing weight and getting in shape. And, you know, if I stay up till like four in the morning, I'm buying about six machines. I'm telling you, I'm buying about six machines. Because they got me all in a frenzy. I, I woke my wife up one night. She said, she, she said, what'd you do? When we first got married, I said, I bought Body by Jay, Holmes. <laughs> you do what? I said, I ordered Body by Jay at 3 in the morning. Called him up. Hey, dude, I need that one, man. They said, the two, we, we didn't just sat and gathered. We, we, we hung laundry on it and stuff. We didn't use it. But I had to get Body by Jay because when I seen it on the commercial, it's like, oh, we got to have Body by Jake, man. Because that's what happened. I'm, I was in a frenzy, like, oh, 
you know, three minutes a day, I could do this, man. <laughs> Crazy. Or we have unrighteous foci. We, our focus is crazy. So he talks about idolatry, witchcraft, drunk, drunkenness, orgies. Only thing I want to talk to you about is, is witchcraft. Because I found out something when I looked at witchcraft. Witchcraft is interesting because witchcraft is this notion of casting spells. You know, I, got, I, I do my job. Maybe it's interesting just to me. So just tell me, you know. You could just turn around and write on your bar or do something else because I think this is cool. Witchcraft is drug addiction. Did you know that? The, the root word for witchcraft is pharmakia, the word we use for pharmacy. Now, if I just ask you how many took an aspirin in the last three days, well, I bet you every hand will go up, right? Because we're all about pain relief, okay? Now, I'll ask you another question. I could do this because I get some laughs. How many of y'all had to get that coffee this morning. Put them up, come on. Had to get that coffee. Addicts, you're addicts. Or how many of you had to get that Pepsi this morning? Some of the kids, be there. that Mountain Dew, or that Jolt or whatever that is. And I seen some of y'all out there doing this. I used to do treatment, it'd be 75 below. And them cats would go outside in the cold room. Because <laughs> they couldn't smoke in the building. <laughs> and kill that cigarette in about three minutes, man. <laughs> and come in talking about it's cold out, man. <laughs> like, you need to quit smoking. That's what you need. Then they tell me, oh, dude, you can't just one thing at a time, man. One thing at a time, dude. <laughs> but we, we're in a culture where we... Spent a lot of time. We think of sorcery as, you know, voodoo or something like that. And it is. Casting of spells. But it's also pharmakia. It's also my willingness to ingest a chemical to get to a different place. So I say, I want to control it and make things fit. It helps me get my life in order. I talk to kids all the time. Why you smoke dope? Oh, man, because when I'm on dope... When I'm, smoking, when I'm smoking bud, I'm cool, man. Everything's cool. Yeah, but you know what, man? I used to smoke that stuff. You get stupid. <laughs> and stupid quick. Nah, man, not me, man. You know, I, I met a kid once, and he was huffing, right? He came to see me, and I'm like, dude, you, you been huffing? And he, he's all huffed out. Nah, man, looking at me like this. Nah, man. I said, dude, you been huffing, dude? No, nah, man, I told you I wouldn't huff, man. I'm done huffing. I said, dude, you got orange paint all over your mouth and your teeth, man. <laughs> oh, and he was done. Because when I'm under the spell, I don't know what's going on. You know, some of you work. That's a spell. I'm at work, and I'm all, uh, ah, everything's fine at work. Some of you, it's the gym. <laughs> getting it, man, getting it. Got to get to the gym, you know. And you're under the spell. Adrenaline and the endorphins kick in. And I'm smiling. <laughs> and then you don't get, to, don't get to work out. I got to get to the gym. I haven't been in the gym in two days, right? Same thing, okay? Drunkenness is this carousing, party, run around, orgies. I want to have as much as possible, okay? So the list is just to say, so some of you hope went, ouch, ouch. The ouch means go to the creator. Do not try to fix this on your own. You hear me? God put the mechanic in. He's under the hood, working. You just can't see him. Oh, man, this gasket's jacked, man. We got to pull that one out. Whew. Your alternator's bad. Whew. He's working already. You wouldn't be here if he wasn't. So what does the spirit want? Spirit wants us to live like freed men and women. See, the, the writing in Galatians is about contrast, life under the law and being bondage, being, bond, being slaves to the law, life under grace and being free, having liberty, having the ability to choose 
See, and that's the problem. Once I get the ability to choose, I also get the problem I have to choose. Once I get the ability to choose, I have to choose, which means before I didn't know I was in trouble. Now I'm in trouble. And I got to choose, am I going to try and get out of trouble or I'm going to stay in it and look to God? The option isn't to choose to get out of trouble. It's am I going to try and get out of trouble or am I going to stay in the tension of it and breathe and even do what you got to do. Talk to God nice. Or talk to God mad, because knowing, knowing, he's not going to run away from me. He's a good dad. The spirit desires that we live and we approach God. The scripture says, approach my throne. The scripture says, all ye who are weary, come find rest for your soul. I got any weary people here? If I do, let me hear this. I got some weird people here. Y'all even did it right, like <laughs> blew it out a little longer. <laughs> okay, weary, tired from the struggle. He says, come, come. He don't say, you, un- you fit and everything, you got, your- you got it going on, got the six pack. He ain't saying, you got six pack, come talk to me. No, he's saying, flabby, come on, man, I got something for you. <laughs> if you. If you tight, man, don't, God ain't got nothing, to, he don't, you know, he'll leave you until you get flabby because you're going to get flabby. And then he says, come talk to me. Tired, exhausted, depressed, discouraged. Those are the people God wants. Roll up his sleeves, cracks his door. Like the commercial, he always leaves a light on. Come on. The spirit desires that we glance at ours and others' performance and gaze at God's promises. Right? So I want to take a peek at the belly button. I'm going to take a peek at Carrie's. No, I ain't going to take a peek at Carrie's. There you go. Get me in trouble. At her behavior. There we go. There you go. Okay? But I'm not be glancing like, oh, you know, she ain't living right, man. I'm telling you. I'm going to glance at that stuff and gaze at God because I can, and I'm going to live under his promises. I'm going to learn his promises. You know, Mike has this thing he's calling four by four. Learn it. Know who God is, what he's done for us, what he knows about you, what he wants for you. Know that stuff. Okay? Because you're going to need that stuff in the heat. And the desire, li- desires, the desire, li- desire, spirit desires that we live in the truth. See, the other thing is the law diagnoses us truthfully. And God is not, he ain't trying to, you know, you come up to him and say, God, you know, I got this thing under control, man. God looking down at you going, go on, man, you'll be back. Because he knows you don't got it under control. You just want to have it under control. Living the truth. You know, God, I ain't never told a lie in my life. (laughs) The button goes up because God knows that, you know, man, you need to, that nose is doing this. You know, God, I ain't like them. And God says, yeah, you are. Just by that statement, you are. Just by the very statement, I ain't like them, you like them. You just did it. So he wants us to live in the truth. Know who you are. Know what your struggles are. But also understand this. The the spirit desires that you act like a child of God. You know what? See, if I have a good dad, I'm hanging out with him, man. I'm hanging out with him. I went to a wedding this weekend. Anybody go to a wedding this weekend? Anybody go to the Nordstrom wedding this weekend? And I'm talking to my man Terry, and I'm talking to his son, and they understand what it is to have a good dad-son relationship. See, I don't get that because I have it. My dad, I had a couple of dads after I got to Sioux Falls. I had some stand-in dads when I, got to, when I was growing up. But me and my pops, we weren't tight. So I don't really know what it's like to be my pops' kid. But I tell you what, I know what it's like to be Dorothy Thomas' kid. I know what it's like to be her kid. And when things got crazy, I'm coming to talk to my grandma. We used to have these conversations late at night, you know. 
And she would ask, like, straight point blank, like, Jay, how come you hanging out with thugs? Like, dang, God, why you had to call my friends thugs, man? They come in the house and steal stuff? That's what thugs do. And I can't argue. I'm like, yeah, they, yeah, they did. I, I, dude ain't coming back to our house, Grandma. And we have a conversation. You know, I came there. She was the first person I told I thought God was stupid. I told her that. She tells me I told her that when I was in fifth grade. I came home and said, you know what, this, this Jesus stuff is crazy, man. Y'all crazy. All, all the priests and the churches want is money. I don't want nothing to do with it. She said, what you going to do? I said, I'm going to pick up a basketball and spin that thing, and I'm going to make it do something. And see, I set my desire. And basketball worked for a little while, you know. Ninth grade, I was a chump. I mean, eighth grade, I was a chump. At ninth grade, I got better. Tenth grade, I'm dunking the basketball. Eleventh grade, I'm playing varsity and junior varsity. Twelfth grade, I'm playing varsity. Freshman in college, I earn a scholarship. Walk on, nobody knows me, earn a scholarship. Then I meet this Christian coach who decides he didn't think I could play. But he's the first man that I ever met. He's the first coach that I ever met that, because he was a Christian, came to me and apologized. And that alone made me start thinking about God again. Because I thought I was going to play pro ball. It didn't happen. But he treated me not just like an athlete. He treated me like one of his kids. He cared about me going to class. He cared about what I was doing. He cared about my asthma, ba ba ba. Then I had some crazy people in my life, a guy named Do uh, Mike Bayak and a guy named, uh, we called him Doc, who would share with me. And Doc would talk to me about Jesus like this. Hey, Jay, man, I was over at the art center, dude, and I seen them art things you do, man. The Lord can use artists in the kingdom. I'm like, man, you're crazy, man. Every, any Christian I ever talked to told me I'm going to hell. You telling me I can be useful in the kingdom? He come over to the gym, I know. He was over watching me practice. I'm like, oh, I ain't even trying to go out that door. Doc found me. Hey, Jay, man, can I talk to you? I'm like, nah, man, because I know where we're finna go now. He said, man, I didn't know you could play ball like that. I said, I know. The Lord can use hoopsters in the kingdom. <laughs> he said, yeah, man, when, when you gonna come? I said, man, I ain't trying to do that old cheesy, lovey-dovey <laughs> Christian stuff, man. That's for, you know, for doom dudes, man. I... But he wanted me to be a kid. Okay. You guys got to operate like God's children. He loves you. He's coming after you. If you're here, he's coming after you. He's going to change you, and he doesn't want He wants you to forever understand you have access to him. And nothing you can do, the scripture says in Romans, nothing you can do can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Spirit desires. Uh-oh. I don't want you to see that yet. I think the spirit is an overwhelming passion and drive towards God. It eventually will captivate us and it will eventually overwhelm. Now, I'm saying overwhelm as we move through life, not now. It will eventually overwhelm the sinful nature. And it points us towards God because God's friendly. And it desires to produce a changed mind and a changed heart. The scripture seemed to indicate that the sinful desires live in my brain. And I, in my work, I see it. The sinful desire can click on in about 11 milliseconds. Before you can blink, I already made a crooked decision. As soon as I perceive fear, as soon as I perceive things not going my way, I make a decision quicker than I can snap, and, and I'm gone. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit can reprogram the mind. It can interrupt an 11 millisecond decision. See, I'm on that. I'm, I'm all over that. That's what I want. So I'm a, I got I to gotta walk in step with the Spirit, meaning I have to keep coming to Christ. What he desires is come to me with it. So I say this, children of God attached to the vine of God's love produces fruit, which are delicious and intended for others' encouragement. So what are the results of godly desires? Fruit. Now, interesting enough, 
Have y'all ever seen a tree eat its own fruit? Y'all ever seen this thing go down? You ever seen a tree do that? Man, it's some good apples, man. Never seen it happen. So you hang your arms out there and the fruit drops. Guess who it's for? It's for the encouragement of others. See, I got this gift, whatever the gift is, and I'm loving to do my gift so I can hear myself do my gift. That ain't what the gift's for. Everybody here not only are children of God, but God gave you gifts and talents that you're to share with us. Fruit. Give me some of that fruit. And some of you share your fruit up front, like the drama team did and the music team did. And some of you share your fruit behind the scenes. But God's spirit does that. So children of God attached to the vine of God's love produce fruit. What produces fruit? Love produces fruit, not me. I don't do this. Fruit, come on, fruit. God's love produces fruit, and it goes out for other people to have. I think this is it. Let me see. Yep. Okay. So let me, let me just give you some tips. On your worship folder, I gave you some tips. In, in summarizing, I just want to say this, and I'm going to read something to you. Tip one, life here is tense and full of conflicts. The scripture seems to indicate that our choices will always be bombarded. Tip two, let God meet you in the middle of your tension. Some of you are here and you're struggling. And you're thinking, because I'm struggling, God's absent. I'm telling you, the struggle is going to bring you to God. And God wants to meet you in the middle of the struggle. Tip three, get to know who God is, what he knows about you, and what he wants for you. Okay? Tip four, Focus more on God and his love and his promises than you do your performance. And the last tip, wait and watch God produce fruit in your life, because he will. Because he will. All right, while I'm reading this last piece, I want the worship team to come forward. They told me if I didn't call them up, I had to sing by myself, and y'all don't really want that. Y'all don't really want it, I'm telling you. While they're coming up, I just want to read this little piece. And it was in Discipleship's journal, and it's uh, a distinction. Now, obedience is, I'm going to define obedience. Obedience in my frame is my stubbornness to, my stubborn refusal, uh, my stubborn willingness to, to connect with God in the face of bad and negative consequences. It's not doing the do's and not doing the don'ts. It's refusing to not come to God. I'm going to come to God, even if everything in me says don't. So what this says is, obedience is seeking God for you with your whole heart. Performance is having a quiet time because you feel guilty if you don't. Obedience is finding ways to let the word of God dwell in you richly. Performance is quickly scanning a passage so you can check it off your Bible reading plan. Obedience is waiting, inviting guests to your home for dinner. Performance is feeling anxious about whether every detail of the meal will be perfect. Obedience is following God's prompting to start a small group or do something. Performance is the reluctance to let anyone else lead group because they might not do it as well as you. Obedience is doing your best. Performance is wanting to be the best. Obedience is saying yes to whatever God asks of you. Performance is saying yes to whatever people ask of you. Obedience is following the promptings of God's spirit. Performance is following a list of man-made requirements. Obedience springs from love of God. Performance springs. You do put the spirit in us. We do thank you that your Holy Spirit will overcome the desires of the sinful nature. We look forward to the transformation that you've started in us even before we became Christians. We thank you most of all for your son and that he was willing to come and give his life 
and make it possible for us to be children of God. I ask that you protect and look over and challenge us as believers. In Jesus' name, amen. You're free to